So, today let us and we were looking at that log z as a function as an example right and then you saw that um, it is not as nicely behaved as the log over reals. So, we will come back to log z again because uh, there is a uh, that infinitely many possible log functions can actually be stitched together into a single log and exactly how to do it we will see in a short while. To do that uh, we will have to look at uh, uh, the concept of analytic continuation which is what I will slowly lead you to. Now, there is one more theorem that I think is important which I should prove it is very easy to prove actually. So, we saw that for analytic functions we have infinite differentiability right. So, if analytic function if f is analytic then f prime all its differentials f prime f double prime and so on remain analytic. We also saw that it is for an analytic function its integral is also analytic that was part of Morera's theorem that uh, if you define f z as then this function f is both continuous and differentiable and therefore, analytic when whenever f is analytic. But there is one more way you can define integral of a function from an integral from an analytic function which is uh, suppose you have a bivariate function which for one um, on one variable is an analytic for every value of the other variable and then you integrate over the second variable. So, for example, suppose uh, we have uh, f z t is So, f is a bivariate function the first is a complex variable second is a real variable and it is continuous on some domain and more importantly for every value of t in the range a to b f z comma t is also analytic on the domain d. The reason I am choosing real variable here instead of continuous is that most of the time we will only be looking at functions of this kind when integrating over this real variable. So, this is enough and the proof here is really simple. Then uh, if you let capital F z to be integral of f z t over d t then capital F is also analytic. So, it is a integral of this small f over the real second parameter which is analytic on the So, this is the theorem.
the proof as I said is fairly straightforward. The first thing to observe is that capital F is continuous and that follows by the continuity of this function. So, if you look at F z and F z plus delta z that is as delta z goes to 0 that the integrand here converges to F z t and therefore, it the integral integral will converge to F z. So, continuity is straightforward. And now, what we need to do to prove that capital F is analytic. Well, if you go by definition, we if we show that this is differentiable, then we are done. But there are times when we can use alternative characterizations of analytic function. For example, the one we showed last time, which is that a function will be analytic if it is continuous and on any rectangle its integral is 0 and it for the in this case that and uh, characterization is really handy. So, since so, so let r be any and we say excess parallel because that makes it even simpler. Then, since f small f is analytic for any value of t, what we get is this is zero. fix any t in this range this is analytic and therefore, this integral is 0 that is by Cauchy okay. and this happens for every t. Therefore, is also 0 oops sorry no what I am saying this should be t z this is d t. So, this is also 0 because integrand itself is 0 here okay. now what is the left hand side of this equation equal to if we can swap the two integrals we are done, but can we swap the two <laughs> integrals that is the question that is a bit tricky over reals we know if there are two integrals over reals in finite range we can swap them that is a classical state theorem, but here if one integral is over reals the other is over complex and that too over a like a rectangle here we can simply use the fact that this is an x x parallel rectangle this integral I can split into four integrals and these four will be real integrals on x when y is fixed on y when x is fixed x y. So, I can write this complex integral over a contour as four finite real integrals and then I can do the swap and then add the four complex a uh, four real integrals again into a one single complex integral and therefore, we get that this delta r a to b this is this and this is equal to
the integral of capital F which is 0. Now, you invoke Morera and capital F is analytic. So, essentially we what we should intuitively take out of this is that analytic functions are very nice functions. They have very well behaved, have uh, uh, all differentials, all integrals of of a certain kinds, and uh, so we can play around with them with reasonable amount of freedom. At the same time, there is I will want to strike a note of caution that do not take them uh, for granted. The analytic functions can throw up rather unexpected behavior as we shall see also. Okay. So, what are the examples analytic functions you have seen? Well, okay, you have seen uh, that all polynomials are analytic, all uh, sin, cosine, exponential, log logarithm also at least in a strip is analytic, it may not be analytic everywhere. And yeah, there is a jump. Yeah, so that's a dis, that's a discontinuity. So it's it's not analytic there. So I said last time that I'll show how to make it analytic, and that's that I'll do later on. Once I discuss power series, then I can do it because I'll need power series to discuss analytic continuation and then I will bring that back in. So, if I forget remind me. Now, one some of these uh, functions uh, polynomials are pretty straightforward functions, but if you look at the exponential function for example, it is a slightly more complex function and we know at least over reals that exponential function has this infinite power series representation using the Taylor expansion. Similarly, log, sin, cosine they all have this infinite Taylor expansion as a power series. So, at least some of these power series therefore, are analytic. The question I want to address is which power series are analytic, because power series are a generalization of certainly polynomials and they also consume or contain all the functions we have seen so far, all the analytic functions we have seen so far at least, right. Because all of these analytic functions can be written as power series. So, let us start our discussion on power series and see which of the power series are analytic. So, definition is pretty straightforward a power series is a is a sum sigma k greater than 0 a sub k z minus z naught to the k. And here I am adopting notation from the real analysis. So, this would be a Taylor series expansion around the point z naught. So, I am just lifting that notation for this and as we will see this will be the right notation for us as well. So, z naught is some particular complex number these a k's are also complex numbers. And such that in 
finitely many AKs are non zero because if only finitely many AKs are non zero then we have a polynomial then we do not have a power series. So, that is a general definition of a power series and it is uh, if we just using binomial expansion expand this out. So, we can always write any such power series as sigma a prime k z to the k. So, these are equivalent definitions this makes it a little easier to understand that we are looking at a power series around this certain point which is in not. Now, the moment you have an infinite sum there are all kinds of issues which arise. We have to address the issue that when is this convergent for any given point z whether the power series is convergent at z or not it becomes an issue which is not certainly not an issue with polynomials they are always convergent. So, and that will be a very important uh, notion for us when we look at the power series in terms of analytic functions as well. So, let us put in some basic facts about convergence of power series before we dive into its analysis. So, let us just talk about convergence therefore. Now, there are several things we can talk about convergence, but I will just talk about the notions which are of real interest to us here. So, I will only define two types of convergences. One is a over its sequence of numbers. So, sigma k a k is just a sum of complex number. We say that this sum is absolutely convergent if the sum of as absolute values of this complex number adds up to some final <coughs> does not diverge. Now, for sums of numbers absolute convergence is kind of a sanity check because if a sum is not absolutely convergent then funny things happen with that sum. For example, if you look at uh, k to be plus 1 if k is even and minus 1 is k is odd and this sum is not absolutely convergent, but if you add it up you can start with a 0 a 1 which cancel each other a 2 a 3 cancel each other. So, you can conclude that the sum is actually 0, but if you take a 0 out and cancel a 1 with a 2 then a 2 with a 3 oh no, a 3 with a 4 a 5 with a 6 then the sum would be plus 1. So, you can depending on how you bracket the sum you will get different values. So, that is really not a very nice summation. So, we do not want this well of course, you never want this to happen, but it does happen sometimes, but we will not want to get into there. So, we will only try to look at absolute convergence of a series. 
Yes. Do these things uh, like the the strange behavior occur for all the infinite sums which are not absolutely not necessarily. That's not necessary. There are. I guess if you look at this. Uh, this sum, then absolutely uh, in absolute terms this diverges, but if you add it up I think it actually converges to a sensible value irrespective of how you bracket, but I do not take my word for it you convince yourself if that is the case. So, there are cases I believe when uh, you do not really necessarily need absolute convergence, but that is like when things are not absolutely convergent then things can be very messy. So, it is pretty safe to look at absolute convergence then the nice things happen, okay, but that is only sum of numbers. What about sum of Uh, well, these are some of powers of z actually, if you, right. So, these are like uh, not just numbers, but these are a whole actually this represents infinitely many such sums one for each value of z and we want to say something together about this whole set of sums. Okay. We can uh, for example, talk about absolute convergence of such a series as well and uh, which you can define easily. So, we say that this sum or this series is absolutely convergent and here we have necessarily have to talk about a particular region in which the value of z lies and that is typically or the natural way of defining the region and we will come back to this later on to justify this choice uh, is to say that z minus z 0 the absolute value is smaller than some number and this we say smaller. So, if it is absolutely convergent in this region if whenever you take any such z that the corresponding sum of numbers absolutely converges. So, that is a natural generalization of absolute convergence there to the power series. Unfortunately, absolutely convergent power series is not strong enough for us, because absolutely convergent power series can at times have behavior which is not very nice. Yes, for every any z in this region, this sum converges absolutely. Show you an example of an absolutely convergent power series, which is not very nice. Okay, let me give you the other definition, and then we'll try to see the difference between the two.
So, we call this power series to be uniformly convergent in a region if the following property holds that for every m greater than or equal to 0, if you look at the difference between the power series and the truncation of power series of to the first m plus 1 terms. So, this difference is bounded by in absolute value this difference is bounded by epsilon m whenever z lies in this region. Okay, so, epsilon m is independent of the actual value that z takes here and further as m tends to infinity this epsilon goes to 0. So, in other words what this is saying is that this truncation of power series becomes a better and better approximation of the full power series in this range. Okay. Now, I claim that this is a stronger notion than that. Do you believe it? Can you show that an uniformly convergent series is also absolutely convergent? That value of epsilon is also That value of epsilon, no. How would you work there? Okay, let me give this as a home exercise instead of you know spending too much time on this. So, this is a general statement what I am looking for here is any implication if you can show that this implies that that is one part of it and that this is stronger. So, we, so that means one example which is absolutely convergent, but not uniformly convergent or if this does not imply this then one example which is absolutely convergent, but not uniformly convergent. So, just make sure that all bases are covered. Good. So, this is the key notion of convergence for us. Now, here is a very useful theorem about power series. Before that let us define So, let r be the largest positive real number such so that this sequence absolute value of a k times r to the k. So, just think of this as a sequence of numbers and see where this sequence of numbers going. And if you naturally if you choose a very small r there is there is more likelihood that this sequence will actually converge to 0 right this the smaller r you choose the more likely you will have that this sequence converges to 0. So, let r be the largest positive real such that this happens the sequence converges to 0. Then ok 
Okay, sometimes it is possible that there is no such largest thing, you can always get a slightly larger one. So, I should not say the largest positive here. Let us say let us R be the limit of so you may have to take a limit, then R is called. this number is well defined, it can be 0, if the a k's are grow so rapidly that uh, it is quite pulp. For example, if a k is uh, k to the k for example, then uh, no r can send this to 0, this is this the sequence will actually keep you no know, diverging. So, then even then capital R is well defined, it is 0, small r being 0 will certainly make this happen. If these grow very slowly, then you can get away with a maybe a very large r also. For example, again if a k is on the other side is 1 over k to the k, then you can get away with every r. So, then the radius of convergence is infinite. Yes. Why do we want the sequence to converge to 0? Don't we want the series to converge? No, we want sequence, each individual number should keep on shrinking and go towards 0. We will see this, this theorem is the motivation that this number defines the region of convergence for the power series. So, let f z be a power series, then for oops, not for then f is uniformly convergent in this region, where r is radius of So, yes it looks a little odd here with by I am 
just looking at sequence of numbers and seeing where that converge that sequence converges, but the connection will be fairly straightforward the proof is reasonably easy here. So, let us show that uh, this is the radius of convergence. So, I should have added one more statement we will do that maybe in the next theorem. So, I need to show that for any small r less than capital R if you look at this region the series converges uniformly right. Okay. A number s between small r and capital R, fine. Now, since s is less than capital R, by definition, we know that at this sequence, this sequence converges to 0, right. That is by definition. That is the definition. So, S is less than capital R. So, this sequence by definition R is the limit of all positive reals R such so, that this sequence converges to 0. That is the definition. This is I am saying R is its definition R is radius of convergence is of the power series is defined to be the largest number or the limit of the limb soup of all the numbers for which this quantity converges to 0. So, this is the definition. Or if it is larger, no, it won't. See, if it converges to any positive number instead of zero, then when you add up, <coughs> you get infinite. Right? So you have to take a big sum. Yeah. So you need it to go to zero. Not the sum. Not the sum. Yeah, it's just a sequence individual numbers is looking at the limit of the individual number. Okay. Now, so this sequence converges to 0 we know that fine. Then therefore, if you look at uh, this quantity of course, is same as this quantity. It is less than equal to this quantity. Now, this is less than equal to
Now, by definition since this converges to 0, this quantity is uh, clearly has an upper bound. For all k, I can write an absolute upper bound on this quantity. Okay. So, this is less than equal to some c times k greater than equal to n. And what is this? This is just a geometric series. This is a fixed number non zero, so this is some C prime times R by S to the N. So, this is your epsilon M, which is independent of the actual value that Z takes inside that region. So, that is property 1, and property 2 was that as M goes to infinity, epsilon M should go to 0 which also happens here, because r by s is a number less than 1. So, as m goes to infinity, this goes to 0. Okay, so that's the proof of the theorem. Yes. Oh, this. So this converges to zero. Okay. So this clearly means that there is an upper bound. This quantity for this series is upper bounded by some number. It doesn't diverge. Right, it's converging to zero or converging to some number, which means that there is an upper bound to this series. So let's see with that upper bound in absolute value. So I can write each one of this as less than or equal to c. Therefore, this holds, and then we are done. Which one? Oh, right, right. This should be greater than m, you are right. So, this is m plus 1. So, this converges in a reasonably straightforward fashion uniformly in that region. 